Now I I introduce the second speaker, Dr. Igor Lakis from the University of Montenegro. And uh, the, the topic will be on language policy in Montenegro, practices, challenges, and directions. So please. Okay, thank you. Hello. Um, I'm going to actually to speak partly as a linguist because I work as a professor of linguistics at the University of Montenegro and partly as a member of the um, Committee of Experts for Regional and Minority Languages in the Council of Europe where I'm the Montenegro uh, representative. So my presentation will briefly touch upon the European Charter of Regional and Minority Languages just to show what the purpose of the charter is. And then I will offer the Montenegrin language map. Although Montenegro is a small country, the language map is quite complicated, just like everything in the Balkans. And uh, I will say something about the trends, linguistic and other trends in Montenegro. Uh, European Charter for Regional and Minority Languages was uh, adopted by the Council of Europe in 1992, but it's uh, implementation uh, started in 1998 after five countries had ratified it. Now 27 countries of Europe are members of uh, the Charter. The Charter protects and promotes regional and minority languages as a threatened aspect of Europe's cultural heritage. And there are many languages that are threatened in Europe. We are not even aware of how many small languages throughout Europe Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Southern Europe are actually threatened and the Charter helps uh, in protecting these languages. Then the Charter enables speakers of regional or minority language to use it in private and public life. And I think this other sphere, public life, is much more important for us because there are many languages uh, are not present in public life of some countries and uh, the Charter tries to make the countries respect these language rights for all the speakers living on its territory. So here I underlined a couple of uh, words that are important for the Charter. Um, the Charter says that regional and minority languages are those languages that are traditionally used within a given territory or state by nationals of that state who form a group numerically smaller than the rest of the state's population. So what we uh, imply by a minority language is a language that, it, that has traditional presence and we need to have a proof that language has a traditional presence on a certain territory, that that group lives in a certain geographical area so that we can actually, if they live in the territory of a municipality or a region or whatever, that they can, there is a sufficient number of speakers so that we can ask the authorities to enable these users to use their language in uh, communication with public administration, local authorities and so on and so on. Um, another requirement is that these languages are different from the official language or languages of that state and they include neither dialects of the official language or languages of the state, nor the languages of migrants. So we here need to make a distinction between minority languages and languages spoken by migrants who came to a country, in, let's say, the last couple of years, or dozens of years. So that's why traditional presence is important. Migrant languages can be protected in different ways. The charter uh, has two parts. Part two is very general. and. When the country ratifies the charter, the country uh, states which uh, languages it protects under part two and which languages are protected under part three of the charter. Uh, the languages that are, has a strong presence in the country are protected by part three and there are many details that uh, you have to respect there, I will show you that later. Part two languages are to those languages that have certain presence on the territory. Perhaps they don't have too many speakers, but the country has decided to protect them. And um, this part is very 
general, provide some general principles. For example, the states recognize and promote these languages, so they recognize them, they promote them, they facilitate their use, they provide their teaching and learning, they promote transnational exchanges, which is very important, so that these speakers can have contacts with uh, speakers from other countries, the same language, and the countries also uh, eliminate their exclusion or restriction. Uh, what is also very important for the Charter is that states uh, need to take into consideration the needs and wishes of the speakers. So it's not up to the country to decide, they always need to include the speakers. Part 3 of the Charter is uh, much more elaborate. So when we look into uh, how the committee actually works, we get a periodical report from a country. It's on a three-year basis. When we get the report, we have a working group of three members, and we read the report, and after that we organize a visit to the country. We call it a spot visit. And we talk to the representatives of all the minorities protected under Part 3, to the NGOs and to the local and national authorities, different ministries and so on. What we look is uh, the language in education, specifically in education, whether the country offers uh, the language at preschool, primary school, secondary school, university level, then judicial authorities, whether, let's say, uh, uh, the speakers of regional minority languages uh, can submit uh, petitions, complaints to courts uh, in their own language, can they get a reply in their own language, do they have a right to interpreters and translators, who pays for the expenses, and many other aspects. Then administrative authorities and public services uh, are the documents, let's say IDs and passports, issued in their language, or at least is uh, their name spelled properly, because in many countries uh, the authorities refuse to spell the names properly in their regional minority language, they transcribe it which causes a lot of problems for the speakers. Or some documents uh, are proper in terms of the names, and some are not. And then when a person comes to a, let's say, a foreign embassy and asks for a visa, uh, they are denied the visa because the names are different. For them, legally, officially, they are different, not the same person. Then uh, we see how media promotes these languages. Are there programs? in those languages in the national media? Do the, uh, do the, the authorities support uh, uh, these programs? Do they give some money to private broadcasters to create programs in uh, minority languages? Then we look whether the authorities promote and support cultural activities and facilities, whether these languages are present in economic and social life of the state, and something about transfrontier exchanges. So there are quite a lot of things we need to look into. Now I will maybe say something about the Montenegrin case. According to the Montenegrin ratification, uh, Albanian and Romani are part three languages uh, in Montenegro. Um, but after the second monitoring cycle, so after uh, six years actually, uh, the Bosnian speakers and the Croatian speakers came to us as uh, 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 committee representatives, committee working group for Montenegro, and asked uh, for the protection of these languages under part two of the charter. So the committee in this case has the right to decide to look into these languages without uh, asking the, the country, the state. But of course we refer to the state and ask them to inform us about their decision in the next periodical report. Serbian uh, is not included into uh, this um, um, charter at all because uh, we have a lot of speakers of Serbian in, Mon uh, in Montenegro and Serbian cannot really be treated as minority language. I can say something uh, now about it. Uh, the problem is that uh, the, the, the ratification for the Charter and what is given in the Constitution does not overlap, really. The Constitution of Montenegro says that the official language in Montenegro shall be Montenegrin, 
the Cyrillic and Latin alphabet shall be equal. And Serbian, Bosnian, Albanian, and Croatian shall also be in the official use. See, here you can see the difference between official language and language in official use, or rather co-official language. And it is not a problem for Albanian, it's a totally different language. And Albanian is used uh, uh, as co-official language in the municipalities where the majority of the speakers, or a significant number of the speakers, are Albanian. There are three or four such municipalities in Montenegro. Here yeah, the problem is Serbian, Bosnian and Croatian because in addition to Montenegro they actually belong to the same, they are the same language practically. Um, uh, the same language with four different names or four varieties of the same language. So here we have a situation where Montenegro is, of, Montenegro is official, Serbian, Bosnian, Albanian and Croatian are official. Let me just now as I said, these are actually the same language. From the linguistic point of view, when we speak about language identity, we speak about the, the structural, genetic, and sociolinguistic aspect. So if you take into consideration, according to Katicic, who is a Croatian uh, linguist, and Bugarski, a Serbian linguist, this is the, the, their uh, idea, their division uh, of uh, language identity aspects, uh, according to the structural aspect, these four languages are definitely the same language from the strictly linguistic point of view, in terms of morph uh, phonology, morphology, syntax, grammar, everything. Of course, it has been proven that they originate from the same language, but this third aspect, the sociolinguistic aspect, is problematic. According to this aspect, uh, every national group has the right to call the language by its national name. So this aspect refers to the value we attach to the language we speak. And uh, of course, after the, uh, after the disintegration of Yugoslavia, we had the disintegration of the language. Actually, the language followed the destiny of the state. And uh, former Serbo-Croatian, which does not officially exist, uh, at least in its name, now is either Serbian, Croatian, Bosnian, or Montenegro. Um, Serbo-Croatian uh, is what we call a polycentric language. So it's the same language with a couple of uh, or four varieties, four varieties of the language. Maybe now when I think that. Serbo Croatian was not probably the, the best name for the language because it excluded Bosnian and Montenegro. And if he uh, had uh, a neutral name which didn't reflect the national uh, aspect, maybe we wouldn't have now four different languages. But in this case, it was just impossible to, um, to do. Uh, so Montenegro was actually the last to be recognized as an official language in Montenegro in 2007, as I said, by the constitution. So we have one language and four varieties of four names, but uh, we speak normally, we communicate normally, 100%. The differences are small, like, you know, uh, English in the south of England and English in the west of England and north of England, but still the same language. So we have the same situation in Montenegro. Here yeah, are the results of the censuses, the, the, first, the census from 2003 and the census from 2011. Uh, that is also an, an important aspect. You see, Serbian in 2003 had 63.49% uh, of all the speakers in Montenegro. That's because there was no mention of. Uh, Montenegro, at least not officially, although there had been a lot of efforts in the 90s to introduce it as an official language. Montenegro was at that time 21.96%. You can notice uh, a drop of Serbian in the last year census by uh, about 20%, uh, even more, and uh, a rise of the Montenegrin. 
Well, the political circumstance is the fact that it is now the official language in Montenegro and other things have contributed to this situation. But we cannot now say that Serbian is a minority language in Montenegro. It is still not a minority language, but there is a downward trend and probably the number of speakers will drop by the next census, which will be in uh, 2021. Then we have Bosniak and Bosnia. That's an interesting situation. Bosniak refers just to the Bosnian population, mainly Muslims. And Bosnian uh, rather refers to the whole territory of Bosnia. Uh, and, uh, Bosnian is the official language in Bosnia. It is also put in our constitution as a co-official language. So you see the number of speakers in 2003 when the situation was not clear between Bosnia and Bosniak was different, but now we have very few speakers of Bosniak and the number of speakers of Bosniak has risen largely. And right? sorry, uh, just on, to clarify, Bosniak, um, where yeah, it's geographically rather, in Bosnia? It, it's yeah. in Bosnia, mainly refers to the Muslim population. So the, the Bosniaks in Montenegro first called it Bosniak too, but when it became Bosnian officially in Bosnia, and in Montenegro, now they rather call it Bosnian, so that's mm -hmm. the trend. And Croatian, the same level, Albanian, the same level. The number of speakers of Romani has risen, has doubled, probably because they move a lot around the region and uh, so on. So these are the trends. But the interesting situation is that you have, for example, a lot of uh, Montenegrins saying that their language is Serbian, even a lot of Bosniaks and Croatians saying that their mother tongue is uh, Montenegrin or Serbian, you know, so uh, when we say language it doesn't uh, overlap with the national structure, which is totally different. So that's an interesting point in sociolinguistic terms, you know, so the, the national <coughs> structure does not overlap at all uh, with the language uh, in <coughs> Montenegro. As for the Albanian, uh, Albanian is very well protected language in Montenegro, probably one of the best protected languages in Europe, <coughs> minority languages, because it is taught at all levels of education. Uh, you can attend the whole education, primary school, secondary school, in Albanian only. There uh, is the Department of Albania at the University of Montenegro. You can use it in courts, you can use it uh, uh, for administrative authorities and public services. It is present in media, there are even Albanian uh, media, radio, TV stations. The state uh, television broadcasts a uh, half an hour program, half an hour news every day uh, on the first channel of national television and also in our program on Saturdays. There are a lot of cultural activities, a lot of transport and frontier exchange with Albania, and Albanians are somehow present in uh, the economic and social life, and in life in general in Montenegro. So that's a well accepted language. It is quite contrary with Romani. Uh, first, because we have a lot of refugees, but then we have the question there, a lot of them are migrants, they're immigrants, they came from Kosovo to, to Montenegro. There's a very strong stigma regarding Roma people, not just in Montenegro, but everywhere. In Europe, you can say, all the reports of the, of the community of experts show that uh, even in the most developed countries, the trauma are faced with stigma. They have very poor living conditions. Uh, the, the, the problem with Roma who came from Kosovo is that a lot of them don't even speak Romani. They speak Albanian. That's the problem. So, but there are improvements in the field of education and the media. And actually, Romani shouldn't have been ratified as a part three language in Montenegro. It just fulfilled the criteria to be part two language, it is also non-territorial language, so it doesn't have this uh, requirement. The new standardization of Montenegro in Montenegro, they carried, of course, a new uh, 
standardization, which is outdated. They try to introduce archaic language, which is totally unacceptable. Uh, they introduced two more phonemes, but this version is not widely used at all. So it will fail. What are <laughs> students? Yeah, I was uh, I was involved in the whole process, and I can tell you much more about it if you're interested later. But uh, uh, it's what is the verdict? That's your verdict. It will fail. Oh, that's it's your verdict. Okay. That's it. Okay. It already has. It already yeah. has. Okay. So uh, the problem was how to call this language in school, and it was a political decision. You call it Montenegrin dash Serbian Bosnian Croatian. And all the children sit in the same classroom. Serbian, Bosnian, and Croatian is not the Serbian, Bosnian, and Croatian spoken in these countries. It's actually the Montenegrin variety. But the speakers call it that way. So all the children learn literature, all the authors, Serbian, Bosnian, and Montenegrin authors. It's a funny situation, but that's, that was a political decision. Now, Serbian. Uh, population Montenegro, they want to get the status of another official language, not official. They want uh, uh, the status of official language and they are now using really political blackmail to get that. I can tell you later about that. And um, as for Bosnian Croatian, there is a tendency to make them closer to real Bosnian spoken in Bosnian Croatian spoken in Croatia. So, the trends are further decline of Serbian, rising trend of Montenegrin, the same level of Bosnian, Croatian, and Albanian, and we don't know what will happen with uh, Romani. It's still a problem and will probably remain a problem. In conclusion, just, if I may, just uh, to say that a language policy in Montenegro will have to distance itself from politics. Politicians are very much involved in the language policy and they actually try to, to attract uh, their voters by discussing language issues. Then the codified version of Montenegro will have to be abolished. Uh, you would expect it to be used in the media primarily, but nobody, almost nobody uses it in the media. They stick to the standard version of, let's say, celebration. Uh, a lot more focus uh, will have to be on Romania in the future because of their position, their situation. And the level of protection of other languages will have to be at least maintained, if not increased. So that's briefly my presentation. If you have any other questions, we can talk about that later. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor Igor Markish, for the challenging um, for the challenging.